Yeah, I think we can already start speaking. So I, I welcome everybody who, who decided to participate in this seminar. Uh, today we are talking about energy security of Georgia and uh, related issues, of course, around uh, many problems and many uh, challenges that Georgia faces on energy security. And we have uh, very special uh, guest speakers. So first of all, I, I present myself. I am Kaha Gogolashvili. Uh, I am a senior fellow of uh, Georgian Foundation for Strategic and International Studies. And I will be moderating this meeting. But main speaker and uh, expert who will, who will uh, provide us with, with ideas and opinion, etc., is uh, Teresa Sabonis, who is uh, already, she is quite well known in Georgia, Iman Iman experts community, first of all. Uh, uh, she is a prominent uh, energy expert, uh, especially on energy security, and she uh, she is a scholar, actually. Uh, now she works in, uh, she is a chair, inaugural chair of the Science, Technology and International Affairs, concentration in the master's degree program at Georgetown University School of Foreign Service. And she used to work in uh, many other institutions, uh, and she also provides advice to the government of the United States. She advised many governments, including uh, governments in former Soviet, uh, um, uh, Soviet space. Um, and uh, she's doctor of science and uh, et cetera, et cetera. So she, she's a really, really uh, good and uh, knowledgeable expert on our region, uh, which is very important. Uh, uh, let's let us uh, start then on uh, our our session. Uh, I think that uh, no, first of all, I would I would ask uh, Teresa to uh, I call her Teresa because I know her quite a long time and uh, she's very familiar to GFSIS uh, and she's uh, quite frequently. Uh, our guest and uh, our visiting uh, uh, lecturer in GFSIS, so uh, I can be a little bit familiar with her, so a little bit uh, 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 simple in. in uh. So uh, please, Teresa, let 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 me to to ask you to start with your introduction, and I ask you to cover some important questions related to uh, Georgia's uh, energy security. Uh, how you see? Uh, Georgia's energy security at this moment, uh, in uh, historical perspectives also, in, in future views about this. Uh, what are the main problems, challenges related to energy security in Georgia? Uh, uh, please cover uh, different aspects of, of these issues, uh, including maybe environment. But I know that you are knowledgeable in all, all these issues. Uh, social aspects, environmental, uh, um, uh, economic economic aspects of energy security. How you see the Georgia today? Uh, is it possible to us believe that we have good, nice or bright future in these regards, or we should be uh, quite skeptical about, about our future in this regard? Yeah, first of all, I, I will just stress that uh, everybody should know and uh, knows this, that energy security is, uh, is a core and very important basis for uh, security of the country in general, for uh, economic development, for uh, social security, uh, for social uh, welfare, and um, many other things uh, are related to energy, uh, how the energy sector works in the country to, to this question. So let me to ask Teresa to start her presentation and then on course of, uh, of, the, uh, of the session we will be putting more questions and we will be guiding the, the, the lecture to, to the direction which is more interesting for us. Yes, please. Thank you very much. I am extremely fond of the Rondelli Foundation and it's always a privilege to get a chance to speak with you in Georgia. Um, <clears throat> discussions about energy security are especially heated in Georgia. I wanted to say these days they're especially heated, but in fact, Discussions about energy security have been heated often in Georgia, 
And this is in part because energy issues have repeatedly put great pressure on the citizens and on the state itself. One of the things to keep in mind as we talk about this is although the definition of energy security is not at all settled, one thing we know is that energy security is in some ways very close to regime security. If you have an industrialized society, if you are urbanized, if people live in close um, urban communities, the loss of energy to, to the population is incredibly disruptive and it's very hard for any government to stay in power when the people are thrown into the dark. Um, in fact, um, if we think about it, whether energy is privatized or in the hands of the government, when a society is plunged into darkness, there is a tendency in democratic as well as in authoritarian regimes to hold the government responsible. So when a government is thinking in a clear way about energy security, they're wanting to think about the long term, but they're also wanting to make very certain that the lights do not dim on their watch. Georgia has focused on energy security longer and more intently than most countries. Um, it actually was the subject of an award-winning documentary in 2003 about the difficulty of changing um, energy systems in, in a developed country. Um, it is one of the few countries that has included energy security in its national strategy documents, um, both in the first national security concept of 2005 and in the concept of 2011, energy got substantial attention, which is unusual in a national security strategy document. Um, for all of its shortcomings, the government of Georgia has applied focused attention to the problem of energy security. And I would say that Georgia has been through three phases of looking at energy security priorities. Um, as you can see on the slide in this first period, the goal was to establish Georgia as a transit state and to reduce Russian imports. Um, this in large measure succeeded. The second period following the Georgia war, the idea was to strengthen the grid dramatically um, and maximally exploit hydropower. And then in the third phase, which I would say we're coming to the end of, um, Georgia focused on bringing the energy sector into compliance with what is called the energy acquis of the European Union. Um, so we're now in that, in that phase and people who work on the Aki speak of it so casually and so often um, that if you're not already an expert, you might feel a little foolish asking about it. So I want to tell you a little bit about what the Aki is and is not. Um, the energy Aki has, joining it has given Georgia better guidance in transforming the energy sectors. It has compelled some transparency, which is often a difficult problem for Georgia. But Georgia has some energy problems that are not common to the members of the Aki. Um, it is not physically connected to any other member of this organization. So essentially, Georgia is a relatively open market trying to be European in the way it buys and sells energy, but none of its neighbors have made those same kind of commitments. Um, so it's not physically connected to any other member. Um, it does receive some exceptions, or as we call them, derogations, because it is surrounded by non-market economies. Um, but it's also in an area, in, an, in, a, in a physical location, where energy is used politically, um, often and energetically by some of the neighbors. And this poses additional um, challenges to, um, to Georgia. The commitments it takes by being a member of the Aki is that it will make the electricity sector um, and eventually the gas sector marketized, that it will do something called unbundling, which um, breaks down monopolies into more understandable ways, um, that it will engage in transboundary electricity um, trade, um, that it will establish strategic reserves, and that it will um, set aside some emergency reserves. What we can say underneath all of this is one of the most important assumptions of all the members of the EU energy key is that the energy sector has to pay for itself. Um, if, you, if the government continually and directly subsidizes the sector, then the temptation to politicize grows and grows. So one of the underlying ideas is that the sector should pay for itself. Another one of the underlying ideas 
is that with the European oh. Union, um, the members are going to move toward decarbonization, which of course for Georgia, given all of its hydro, is um, is an is is an issue that is less of a struggle for Georgia than many other issues in energy security. Mm -hmm. Well, with all this policy attention, has Georgia attained energy security? Well, critics from many different directions say that it has not. Um, your deputy minister says that Georgia should not be importing more than 10 to 15 percent, um, whereas currently it's 35 percent. The petition, which many of you are familiar with, the Namakwane uh, petition, the petition against the project, says the government continually engages in risky projects that endanger natural ecosystems. Um, World Experience for Georgia, which has done some very good quantitative analysis, says that Georgia has very high energy poverty. The World Bank says that transparency, that understanding what the prices are in Georgia and when they will change is the weakest point in its, um, in its electricity programs. The International Energy Agency says that um, Georgia spends almost 7% of its entire budget on subsidies in gas and electricity. Um, and that many of the agreements are undisclosed and this makes, makes it difficult to compete. You have some really significant challenges from the de facto Republic of Abkhazia, including the fact that per capita consumption in Abkhazia is two and a half times higher than per capita consumption in the rest of Georgia. Um, and that that demand keeps growing. Um, and that Abkh Abkhazia frequently takes more than its agreed share away of power away from the Georgian system. We also have the challenge, <coughs> excuse me, that consumption of electricity in Georgia has risen faster than expected. Um, this has been driven both by your move to becoming a service economy, so more and more of the country is air conditioned for the tourists, um, but also importantly by cryptocurrency. Yeah. So we look at all these problems. How do we prioritize them? Um, how do we think about this? Well, in part, it depends on how you define and prioritize energy security. So if we think about the official definition, the International Energy Agency, um, which most of Europe is a member of um, and the United States is a member of, they actually have a definition of energy security. They say that countries must balance reliability, affordability, and environmental friendliness. And if you think about those three words, you might say, yes, we want more of all of those. The problem is with existing technology, this is what we call a trilemma. So in other words, the more you try to emphasize one of these, the more you're gonna damage another one. So it is a three-legged stool and trying to think about how to keep it in balance is really problematic. Um, I would argue that although this is the standard three set of problems in energy security, it leaves out a fourth problem, which is very important for Georgia. And that fourth problem is reducing dependence on sources that threaten the Georgian state or its values. If you are a very large market, then you can buy from a supplier that others might find threatening. If you are a small market, you have to worry about this. If you are a well-developed market, there will always be little pockets of corruption. But if you are a developing market, there is opportunity for great corruption that can disrupt the whole system. Um, if you are a country where the center and the periphery have positive relations, then the center can organize with other provinces um, to cooperate in a country like Georgia, that's very fractious. So this fourth category, um, reducing dependence on sources that threaten the Georgian state or its values, ends up being a really important whole set of challenges that Georgia has to, has to consider. And what policymakers are facing is that you're comparing risks that are not similar. If the warning sign, if the warning sign on our um, on our dangerous vehicles said there's no agreement about how risky things are, um, as this cartoon shows, it, it would be quite comical. But in fact, we don't have agreement about which risks are the most important, how to measure them, or how to compare them. Um, so in other words, we don't have a consensus on what level of environmental risk is acceptable, but we have even less of a consensus on how we should compare environmental risk 
with political risk and which of those should concern the state more. States often make choices uh, that unsettle their neighbors because these nations are trying to think about energy security and they define it in a specific way um, that their neighbors don't share. So for example, when Germany advocates Nord Stream 2, they are arguing we are a large market, Russia will not threaten us, we are more transparent than, than Ukraine. So if Russia and Germany join up directly with undersea pipelines, that improves European energy security. Turkey is in the midst of building a nuclear power plant. And by the contract of that power plant, Russia will build, own, and operate all four power plants for the lifetime of the reactors. For neighboring nations, this is very concerning. But Turkey says we have a fast growing uh, population. We have a fast growing demand for energy. If we're going to stay ahead of it, particularly in an era where the world is decarbonizing, we need this nuclear. We've tried to build nuclear three times before and failed because of the finances. Russia is willing to finance it. This diversifies. So we will choose to do this. The third example is one that I think you'll all find a very sympathetic one. But if we go back in time, it's a curious one. Lithuania announced that they were having a lot of problems with Russia um, and with Russian supply of gas. And so they set out to build one of the world's first floating natural gas, liquid natural gas facilities. At the time when they set out to do this, it was very expensive. They warned the citizens, this will double your electricity bill and this will double your gas bill. And even if Russia offers us a discount on gas, we will not permit more than 50% of our gas to come from Russia. Domestically, it was very unpopular. Lithuania reached out to the neighboring states and said to the other Baltics, will you join us in this facility to bring the cost down? Latvia and Estonia looked at domestic unrest in Lithuania and said, no, we will not. This is, this is a very expensive way to get energy security. Lithuania moved forward and the government almost fell because of the magnitude of this investment and the pressure that it put on the citizens. But the facility was finished the same month that Russia invaded Ukraine. And so suddenly Lithuania looked very wise and the other Baltic states wanted to participate in the project. The issue here for all of these states is that when nations look and say what threatens us the most and try to pursue it, they often disquiet their neighbors and often um, they get it wrong. But if we think about what states are doing what they're trying to do is figure out where will we accept risk and where will we accept cost. And I want to call your attention to the fact that at the same time that Germany is a supporter of Nord Stream 2, they also lead Europe and lead the world in renewable energy. For Germany, the environmental problem, the climate change environmental risk problem is so important that they are willing to incur political risk by getting closer to Russia in natural gas. They are willing to um, do this because next generation energy is expensive and Russian gas is cheap. So every country balances risk is what you might pay if you get it wrong. Cost is what you're willing to pay to reduce risk. And so balancing these four things is always a challenge, not only for Georgia, although in Georgia, these are very sensitive and very loud um, challenges, but even in states with very strong policy systems, there's gonna be a debate about where do we accept cost and where do we accept risk? So with that in mind, let's look at some of Georgia's costs and risks and keep in mind, however much you might hate any of these options, every option has unavoidable trade-offs. So let's think about what some of your issues are. In the past, when Georgia tried to focus very hard on thinking about how to deal with these four sectors, um, Georgia focused very heavily on reliability and on affordability. Um, and there has been a notable absence of policy development in environmental friendliness and reducing dependence on sources that threaten Georgia have focused entirely on how foreigners affect Georgia. All right. So one of the big areas where uh, Georgia focused on trying to reduce its vulnerabilities was with the grid itself. Now, remember that one of the two main priorities for the previous period was strengthening the, the grid. And currently the deputy minister's concern is that a stronger grid makes rising imports easy. 
Um, and that in fact has been the case. Uh, what you should understand is that Georgia both imports and exports at different times during the year. But from 20, 2006 to 2010, Georgia's exports are rising. Ever since 2011, they've been decreasing. Georgia is now a net importer. Um, Georgia is using this big grid to, as I said, both import and export. Um, it imports and exports regularly with Georgia, with Russia. It imports and exports regularly with Azerbaijan. The map that you see here um, is an interactive map, a dynamic map that GSE has posted on its website. You can get a snapshot every three minutes of what's going on. And yesterday evening, I took this snapshot. And what we see is Georgia is simultaneously exporting to Turkey, exporting to Armenia, currently exporting to Azerbaijan, while it is importing marginally from Russia. So what's going on here? Well, your grid is not as fully integrated with itself as it will be eventually. But what you see is there are regional surpluses. And there are also private actors who are selling to Turkey. Um, what you see there is some exports largely from Shuakhevi. What you see there are some exports from your thermal power plants. So cost causes you to export in some places, even as you're importing in others. And of course, we'll come back to it, but the strange problem of the Abkhaz portion of the grid um, drives some other issues. But what you see is that Georgia has gotten very good at reducing technical losses on the grid, that the grid is well designed, that the grid is integrated, and that you are constantly importing and exporting with your neighbors. Um, and that was a conscious policy choice. Um, that policy choice was by most measures successful. There are still some parts of it that are being finished because if you look closely and you see those blue places and the purple places, the blue places are hydro and those are gonna be seasonal. So they're gonna be very productive at this time of year, but not as productive in the winter. The thermal plants, the purple ones, are gonna be productive whenever you ask them to be, but those also have a higher level of associated um, pollution. So originally Georgia wanted to be a transit state. And now Georgia is questioning, if we're really good at buying and selling to everybody, does that undermine efforts to be more self-reliant? Um, there are advantages and there are disadvantages um, of trying to pursue self-reliance. Um, I have put them here on the slide. I want you to think about them. I don't want to, I don't want you to make a judgment about whether um, being a transit state is better or worse than being self-sufficient. I wanna come back to that later. But this is one of the challenges that has to be considered. Do you want to supply Turkey or do you want to stay focused on, on supplying Georgia? If you have seasonal surpluses, are you content to be an exporter sometimes and an importer sometimes? Or as the deputy minister thinks, are there reasons why Georgia never wants to import high levels, but still dreams of sometimes exporting? That's one problem. Let's look at another one because Georgia has a lot of interesting challenges. And that is Nguri. Now, Nguri <coughs> produces 32% of all of Georgia's electricity. It is also the cheapest source of energy. But as you all know, in the winter, it drops to a very low level. And um, as you know, Angori has had to get some significant investments recently. If you look here, what you see behind the dam is, is the reservoir. The reservoir is currently being dredged. Um, that means at significant expense, there is underwater excavation to clean out silt and dirt. Why? Well, because that reservoir was filling so dramatically that um, it was able to hold less and less water over time. So it becomes necessary to improve the capability. Nguri was closed for three months just recently. Um, why? That was because Nguri is a very specific design of hydropower plant, um, an unusual design, although there are other places in the world that have it. It's a mountain design. Uh, what you see here in the upper right-hand corner is the dam traps the water but then the water goes into a tunnel. 
and the underground tunnel, which, um, which shoots across 15 kilometers, um, increases the speed of the water. And then when the water hits the power facility, you can get more power for less water. This was regarded as a really exciting design in the Soviet era, but as you see from the map, contemporary politics makes a really unusual problem. And that is the dam itself is entirely in uncontested Georgian territory, but the tunnel transverses six kilometers of territory claimed by Abkhazia. And the place where the power, where the electricity is actually physically generated is in territory controlled by Abkhazia. In addition, um, the second largest power plant in Georgia, uh, Vardnili, which captures that water and uses it again, is entirely in the Abkhaz controlled territory. So this creates all sorts of problems, which you can imagine. And if you have some questions about that, we can, um, we can um, take them up in the Q&A. But essentially the agreement that was made, and it has always been an informal agreement, both before and after the, the 2008 war, has been that Abkhazia recognizes Georgian ownership of the power plant, both of Nguri and of Vardnili. So Nguri Hasi is the power plant that's on Abkhaz controlled territory. Vardnili is the um, dams and again, additional power facilities that are downstream. Um, so the de facto government recognizes Georgian ownership and control in exchange for getting 40% of the electricity generated by these facilities for free. In Gorihasi, the Georgian company uh, restored Vardnili um, and the final restoration was completed in 2018. In 2017, we discovered how much danger the, the tunnel was in um, and repairs had to keep being put off. They were put off until this year when they were finally completed. Um, in 2018, um, at the power generating facility, there was a disaster that caused um, the facility to be closed down completely and it had to be drained. And then there are still three small power plants that are small, um, but they are in the tail race. So in that part that you can see that goes after the big dam, uh, after the big power generation. Um, and Guri Hasi is out actually proposing to rebuild those three facilities um, which were completely destroyed in the wars, um, but the canal still exists and the water still flows there. So in the estimation of the Georgian company, it makes sense to renovate, to reconstruct those, even if once again, they have to give 40% of the production to the de facto Republic of Abkhazia. Now I'm sure that everyone's blood pressure is going up and that this is a very frustrating set of questions. Now, what you should be aware of is that the de facto government of Abkhazia only has one facility besides Ngori Vardnili. So all of the power for de facto Abkhazia comes from Ngori Hasi. Um, the de facto government of Abkhazia has not undertaken any significant electricity reforms. Demand, as I mentioned before, in Abkhazia has grown dramatically and some of that supplies the facility the russian military facilities um abkhazia has been very reluctant to make any electricity reforms and the reason why Inguri hasi takes on the debt of doing work like the work at vardnili is because it's disputed territory so legally um they have to make a deal with the company in order to do any of this um, because of the legal implications of the territory being occupied. Should Georgia take a chance with, the, with, with this? Should donors? Well, there's some interesting issues. The de facto government has a, requested assistance to reform Sukhumi. If they got this money, they would fix the grid there um, and use it as a demonstration project. They would implement metering for households um, and begin the disconnecting of non-paying customers. That project, if it went forward, would cost about $5 million. Um, Sukhumi is not all of the de facto region, it's 33% of it. Um, but one of the extraordinary things to keep in mind here is that the losses in the grid, so in other words, electricity that disappears and is either uh, mostly is 
through technological problems or through theft, 30% of the electricity is lost in the system. So improving it would create a lot more delivery of electricity to households. <clears throat> the de facto government is very excited about the idea of renovating, um, of, of Ingri Hasi renovating the three small facilities. Um, they um, want the same deal that they have with Inguri and Vardnili. Um, and in a small but interesting display of an effort to um, reduce some of the problems, currently the de facto government has banned all cryptocurrency mining and is enforcing that ban, investigating it and cutting off facilities that are trying to do cryptocurrency mining. And they are leaving that in place um, until June. If they remove that in June, that will be very disappointing. But at the moment, they have only promised to leave it in place until June. And they're interested in talks about um, how to reduce some of Abkhazia's other problems if Abkhazia continues to aggressively deal with the cryptocurrency problem. Again, I don't want you to answer yet. Remember, all of these choices are unpleasant, right? So um, let's look at the next set of unpleasant choices. When you look at um, Georgian hydropower, what you should see um, is that two of the three very controversial facilities that were proposed to be built um, in Georgia, Nenskra and Khudone, both of them are also on the Inguri River. And I wanna explain to you why um, those were proposed. Originally, it was a Soviet idea. Inguri is a very powerful river. The idea was to build multiple facilities on the same river, maximize the use of that one river. In typical Soviet fashion, and they did this in many countries, the Soviets did not begin with the most upstream dam, which potentially could have been the most powerful one. They began with a dam in the middle as a kind of proof of concept. And they built that dam with the intention of going upstream and building the rest of the cascade. In Georgia, as in Kyrgyzstan, as in Tajikistan, um, as in um, Russia itself, the upper dams never got built. So a dam that was designed to be in the middle of a hydro system became the only dam or the first dam in a hydro system. Whichever dam is the first one, um, is going to get a lot of pressure. It's going to get the most silt. Um, it's going to need the largest reservoir. Um, Inguri was not designed to be the largest dam in the Cascade. And that's one of the reasons why the reservoir is now being dredged and why it's so full. Um, if, if you built one upstream of Inguri, then Inguri would be much less important in the Georgian system for two reasons. One, you would have an additional sources of power. And two, Inguri could be run with less reliance on the dam uh, because you can manage the water from further upstream. So it was essentially an effort to continue with the Soviet era plan, but also an effort to reduce power on Ingori and by the way, reduce Abkhazia's ability to dictate terms for Ingori um, by building the upstream facilities. That of course proved to be incredibly problematic and although the government has never said that they're done with that, they have now turned their efforts uh, to Namakhwani. Namakhwani is on a different river. One advantage of Namakhwani, and there are many disadvantages, but please listen to what the advantages are, is all of Georgian hydropower is concentrated. The highest power hydropower is all in the far west of the country. And um, the idea of Namakhwani was to create something more to the center of the country for the purposes of the grid, that would have been a good idea, right? Look at these numbers before I go forward because what you should see is not only is Inguri big, Inguri is so much bigger than any other facility. And look at this list. Um, uh, Vardnili is also in de facto Abkhaz territory. Um, when you look at the list, the next largest existing facility in Georgia, which is also very controversial for very good reasons, is Shuakhevi. And although Shuakhevi is high megawatts, Shuakhevi has no reservoir. The reservoirs are environmentally very unattractive. They displace people. They, they destroy 
heritage, but if you don't have a reservoir, you cannot operate them in the winter. So the third largest power plant in Georgia and the only power plant in Georgia that does not have a complex relationship with de facto Abkhazia is Shuakhevi. And if you go after um, Shuakhevi, then we're on to Vartsikhe, which is also only seasonal, and Shinvali, um, which is the next largest of the regulating ones. So when the Georgian government says they want big hydropower, the reason they want big hydropower is because if you don't have a reservoir, you cannot produce electricity in the winter. And so for reasons of optimizing the river and Soviet hydrology, the Georgian government thought that large upstream large scale hydropower was a good idea. There's a third issue and this connects to um, the European Union energy a key. Every member of the a key has to explain how it will solve its N minus one problem. The N minus one problem is a very engineering sounding term, but it means how will you still run your system if you lose the single largest piece of it? In the Georgian situation, Angori is a really bad N minus one problem because it constitutes more than 30% of all of your installed capacity. So uh, as I mentioned, um, Nenskra and Hudoni were proposed, both of them on the Anguri River. And we've got Nenskra, Hudoni, and Namakwani all proposed right now. And what you see here is in an effort to reduce foreign risk, Georgia has created huge domestic political risk. Each of these facilities um, threatens to displace and causes mobilization in communities who already have a lot of problems with Tbilisi. Um, the government continues to pursue these because the government is focused on this international strategic Georgia should be self-sufficient goal. Um, the more there is pressure on the government, the more the government is secretive about these large projects. And because the government is pursuing as many as possible at once, this makes opposition organized to, impose, to oppose it. The government defines the problem as we're not messaging right. Um, the government says that maybe there's Russian influence on the NGOs, but the reality is um, there have been very poor environmental impact assessments. There are some significant problems with land ownership. There are some very significant problems with local governance and local benefits. I wanna talk for a minute about each of these. The environmental impact assessments have been highly criticized. Um, Georgia has focused on being very deregulated and in some instances unregulated. What this means is it's hard to establish clear sets of standards. The blueprints for all these facilities, large and small, come from other parts of the world. All of them are built to meet standards of the host country. Georgia itself has not established clear standards for hydropower. Um, Georgia does not have a strong regulatory and Georgia does not have a strong cadre. In Georgia, it is typical for a dam operator to spend his entire career at the same facility and never spend time at any other facilities to compare how they do things, to compare best practices. In the United States, by contrast, even though many of our dams are in private hands, all of our large dams have to submit themselves to peer review. We put together teams of engineers from other facilities who come and look at it and note what the dam is doing well and poorly and make recommendations about best practices. This improves the qualification of the engineering cadre. It also puts pressure on facilities that are either not operating efficiently or not operating safely. And we do have a much stronger uh, regulatory. You tend to not get good environmental impact or risk assessments if you don't have a large cadre of people who are experts and who can assess the facility itself. Another issue in Georgia. When Georgia went to build facilities at Ninskra and Hudoni, they assured the international development banks that all the people who own the land who were being displaced were being compensated. What Georgia did not mention is that most people had traditional claims to the land which they had never filed with the government. These people, as you well know, um, in Georgia, a large percentage of landowners never filed their clear ownership claims with the government because they were avoiding taxes. But that leads to a lack of clarity about who actually owns the land. Um, so there are fundamental land ownership problems that Georgia should solve, not only when it wants to 
take land away by eminent domain, but ownership of land is still very unclear in Georgia. The government promises that they will give benefits to the local to um, the local facility, but most of your rural facilities still have no budgeting authority. So if the government or if a corporation gives a large amount of money in order to have a dam built there, getting that money to the people is absolutely uncertain. How to make sure that locals benefit is really problematic. In the example of Shuakiri, um, the facility insists that they did not degrade the water um, in the area. Locals insist that those who had been dependent on springs are not getting um, the water they used to get. The government agreed to put in a municipal water provider, but with no water pur purification. So now the villages are receiving water, but it's unusable. And they say, we're not getting water, we're getting mud. In every event where a community becomes home to a large dam, there should be some infrastructure benefits to that local community. And if that's not built into the cost, and if that's not built into the government's plan, that's incredibly problematic. The other issue, of course, is if the government is not optimizing, if the government is not seeking to get the most out of every dam, then it is always in a race to build more instead of in a race to make sure that it's making the best investments. Um, if we think about where, yeah, I want to open, I want to stop now and open four questions. Um, yeah. but I, yeah, I just wanted to remind you. So so interesting that I I couldn't couldn't stop you. Uh, Sorry. <laughs> because actually, yeah yeah yeah. Because actually, uh, you almost responded uh, uh, all interesting questions that that could have arisen. But uh, still, let us to to ask the participants to okay. put their questions to put their questions forward in written form. Uh, I think it comes to Q and A, uh, but uh, but let me before before I see questions from participants or uh, or there is one raised hand by Nana Pitschelani. Uh, maybe I ask. Uh, let me to. Maybe I ask our host uh, uh, Katie to to give Nana possibility to just orally to to formulate her question orally is it possible yeah please nana yeah go ahead we'll um, see you so can you hear me oh so now you can see me as well so um, uh, thank you very um, much for giving me the floor so yeah, I, I can introduce that nana is a very very experienced uh, public servant working years and years in the Ministry of Energy and uh, so she, she's really uh, knowledgeable in this issue. So I expect interesting questions from her side. Yeah. Thank you very much, dear Kraha. So allow me to welcome you all, my dear Teresa. I'm so glad to hear you here again. Uh, so not to lose your time, I directly go to the question. So my question is regarding the Anguri hydropower plant. You all remember several years ago, there was some uh, gossips and some uh, movements from Georgian side that maybe there would be allowed Russian to be in the management system of the uh, hydropower plant. And this were le legalized with the opinion that this will help Georgia to take, uh, bring and to take from Abkhaz side the uh, uh, money for the pay, uh, which will be paid for the electricity and the Russian side will be uh, managed this. So this is, here we talk about the millions of lorry. So what's your opinion? Uh, what would be more challenging for Georgia to allow Russians to be part of the management of the Anguri hydropower plant or it's still uh, better to find the way how to communicate with Abkhaz to start the metering system and collection of money. Thank you very much. Nana, it's great to hear you. Um, and thank you for the question. So what she's referring to is right shortly after the war, um, the Georgian government made a secret deal with Interrao. Um, and the secret deal was that um, if the owner, if the management um, would involve Interrao as well, that instead of Abkhazia, then Russia would, um, would create a more legal basis for the sharing of electricity. Um, it was a secret deal. 
Um, and in fact, the Russians leaked it. And when the Russians leaked it, the Abkhaz were greatly offended that the Russians were making secret deals without informing them. And the Georgian people were greatly offended that the government was making secret deals with the adversary. Nana's question, would that have been a better way to manage the facility? No. Um, the issue is legally, um, finance, okay, legally it would have simplified things. Um, financially, it would have improved things, but it would have constituted recognizing Russia um, as the manager of Abkhazia, um, and it would have created a situation where the Abkhaz themselves would have increased incentive to attack the facility. Um, so there was a there was a thinking. It was politically impossible, but it also had to do with the security of the facility itself. And I would say that I recognize that it was tempting. I don't think that the Georgian government should be blamed for trying to negotiate that. Um, they withdrew it because of popular sentiment. But the other reason to withdraw it was security of the facility. Um, if you look at who actually runs the power plant, it's an interesting thing because um, you know it's located entirely in Abkhazia. And, I, and when you interview the people who work there, uh, many of them will tell you, we don't have any Abkhaz here. In fact, the cadre is almost entirely Megrelian. And so I think the question that Georgia has to balance is not only one of the management of Nguri Hasi, it's also how do you ensure that the facility continues to be manageable? How do you ensure that the Megrelians have this source of income and this way to cooperate with Georgia um, and I think that um, the Abkhaz, the de facto government in Abkhazia, all the recent things they've done with Varnili and the canal and the proposals, they desperately want to improve this relationship. In the present moment, the de facto minister of energy is quite clever. Now, can the government, can Abkhazia be relied upon? No. Can the Russian state be relied upon? No. Um, Interrail, the company that would have engaged in management, is one of Russia's more credible companies. But even Interrail has a well-earned reputation that in a country with strong rules and regulations, they operate honestly. In a country where they can get away with a lot, they get away with a lot. So what Interrail would have tried to get away with in de facto Abkhazia um, is a legitimate area of concern. Um, so I'm afraid, Nana, I didn't give you a great answer, but I think I illustrated why this is such a tough question. Yeah, um, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, Nana, for your question, and thank you very much, Teresa, for your answer. Uh, yes, it's it's really difficult question, and uh, we we understand that uh, there, there could not be short answer on this, but still, it was really uh, really very interesting what you told us. Uh, I um, before before I'm expecting other questions. Um, uh, I'd like just to ask you one thing. We are talking about only one possibility of the energy future of Georgia. It's the development of hydropower plants. So hydropower seems to be something uh, that has no alternative in Georgia. Uh, in the same time, uh, uh, Georgia uh, should have some other possibilities too, right? No, I, I'm not. Uh, uh, I'm not talking about. Uh, hydrocarbons and fossil fuel and uh, this kind of things, thermal uh, uh, energy stations, electro st uh, uh, electric stations, because, uh, uh, because of environmental concerns related to all this. But uh, uh, no, neither about imports. But what about the alternative sources like uh, solar or wind power? Uh, you can be skeptical about it or any other experts. Usually Georgian experts are quite skeptical about this and the ministry also, as I see. But what you think, uh, has uh, this kind of uh, energy generation uh, a future or at least uh, to take some part, to, to have some uh, uh, stake in, in uh, energy balance in Georgia? Even GSE, which originally was very skeptical about renewable energy, um, has been increasing its estimates of what the future of, of non-hydro renewable will be in Georgia. And I do think that the renewable technologies have arrived at a, at a development moment where they're increasingly attractive. 
One interesting thing that Georgia has done in renewables, and I mention this because it's small and it may not be visible to many of you, um, is that in some of the very rural areas, um, they've made the decision that installing small scale solar on households was a more effective way to electrify those households, at least for part of the day, um, than connecting them to the grid. Um, this is the same conclusion that India arrived at about larger communities in India. Um, disaggregated solar, so solar where we put solar panels directly on houses and schools and clinics is actually very important, very useful, improves resilience and, and reduces um, places where the grid are stressed. So small things like that, there is no question that Georgia should use more and more of them. If you're talking about large scale where you want to put it into the grid, um, Georgia probably has more wind potential um, than solar potential. The challenge wow. with wind and the challenge with solar um, is that you need a very strong grid. And here's why Georgia has incredible potential in wind and solar. If you're going to build a grid that has a lot of wind and solar, it's generally regarded that you either need a lot of hydro or a lot of gas. Now, I want to explain why that is. Um, that's because demand goes up and down every 24 hours. So at 2 o'clock in the morning, nobody really wants to use much electricity. You're asleep in bed. At 6.30 in the evening, everybody is home. Everybody is preparing food. Everybody is using all their electronic devices. And demand goes very high. So when you build a grid to serve a country, you have to have one that will not have surplus at 2 a.m., but they can meet the very high demand at 6.30. And so the way that you try to deal with that, so in a typical grid, demand is gonna fluctuate 150% in just 24 hours. So it's actually a very difficult problem. If you have a lot of coal or a lot of nuclear, you cannot turn those things up or down. You have to leave them on. So you have to fit renewables in around it. But if you have hydro, yeah. you, can, you can turn off all the hydro use the sun while it's shining, use the wind while it's blowing, and then switch to hydro. So for example, in America, um, Hoover Dam, most summer days, we don't even turn it on until after the sun goes down because there's so much renewable energy coming in from California. So hydro is actually the perfect balance for wind and solar. The reason why GSE didn't like hydro early on, I mean, didn't like wind early on, is that you do have to be very good at balancing. They're much better now at balancing, so there's a lot more room for renewables. I believe that there's gonna be substantial Georgian growth in wind and in solar. I believe that you're joining the energy, um, the EU energy at key makes you a more attractive place for investment. I do believe that there's a lot of room for foreign direct investment in that field, and I think it will grow substantially. I do believe that hydro will remain the anchor of your grid into the future for a long time. Yes, uh, thank you. Thank you for, for this response. There is one question from Valery Cecilashvili, who, who is Ambassador Cecilashvili, is uh, well known also man in Georgia. Uh, uh, how important is energy consumption structure for energy security? Is Georgia's energy consumption structure rational enough? Is cryptocurrency production wars to be encouraged by state? Uh, is it normal practice? So, uh, well, uh, in somehow some parts of the question are rhetorical, I understand, uh, but, but still, it's really interesting issue because, for example, uh, last year, uh, despite of this uh, lockdown in Georgia because of this, uh, uh, the coronavirus and everything uh, has stopped, all the production and uh, uh, economy practically was uh, uh, stalled. We had uh, uh, important increase in consumption of energy in Georgia. And this is seemingly due to this use uh, of energy for cryptocurrency, which I also suspect that in many cases um, is not uh, uh, it's it's not accountable. So and uh, in in many cases uh, it's some kind of shadow consumption, but uh, uh, nobody. Uh, it seems that there is no real control on it. So what do you think about all this? 
Okay, um, so consumption structure is extremely important. I was glad that Georgia finally adopted um, the, the, the framework laws on energy efficiency um, because um, controlling consumption is, is very important. Um, the current construction, the current consumption structure, I would agree with you that cryptocurrency is the biggest problem. Now, I want to be sure that I clarify that my interest is energy security. From an energy security perspective, cryptocurrency is a disaster. Um, it is attracted to countries that have two qualities. The first is they should be coal. And the second is that their electricity should be underpriced relative to the rest of the world. Yeah. Um, they're attracted to coal places because this, the, um, the large computer servers, um, if, if they can operate in a cool environment, then you don't have to waste money cooling them. Um, underpriced relative to the rest of the world because cryptocurrency basically, if we imagine a currency that is tied to gold, that's an old fashioned kind of currency, cryptocurrency is actually um, tied to electricity. Uh, when they are trying to make more, when you are mining cryptocurrency, you are solving complicated math problems. When the, the value goes up, then the number of problems that you have to solve gets more complex and uses more electricity. So in other words, when the price, value of cryptocurrency fluctuates, the electricity no. demand in Georgia will fluctuate. And this is a disaster. Um, cryptocurrency creates very few jobs. It often is tied to, um, to illegal sectors. Many governments are now making government cryptocurrencies deliberately to try to reduce the number of cryptocurrencies that are not attached to governments. Um, it, is, it is, China has banned unofficial cryptocurrency mining because of the strain it puts on the grid. Um, Georgia's solution has been an interesting one. Uh, you have compelled, you may have, may have heard that the ministry is very proud that um, in the nearest future, there will be a hundred of the largest consumers in Georgia will be forced to go on open market. <clears throat> what that means is they will be forced to let the price of their electricity fluctuate with Georgian demand. So in other words, you can produce all the cryptocurrency you want at 2 a.m. because it will be quite cheap and Georgia's getting rid of its surplus electricity. But if you're trying to produce cryptocurrency at 6.30 in the evening, you will be punished economically. That's better than not charging them yeah. based on time of day, but my preference would be to make it more difficult for cryptocurrency to be mined at all. Um, it is a very problematic thing. It does, I consider it a vampire on, on grids of countries that are not yet fully developed. And the only way that you could control it through price is if you raise the Georgian price of electricity. And since your people, many of your people already face significant energy poverty, it's a problem to just let the price rise and let the market decide. So um, I am in favor of, of regulating cryptocurrency more tightly. And I do not think that it should be encouraged by the state. Um, there's another question I can see in the chat about does Abkhazia really only take 40%? Yeah, absolutely, yes, yes. So- yeah, This is also uh, uh, certainly a somehow rhetoric question as well. <laughs> So uh, the, the agreement, which has never been written formally anywhere, because of course, uh, Georgia doesn't recognize Abkhazia, Abkhazia as a de facto government. So how do you make an official agreement with an illegal entity? It's, it's all very complex. But the tradition is that they only take 40%. Here is the problem. In Guri plus Vardnili is their entire grid. All right. In the winter, in Guri production goes down. They have no other means uh, to supply power in, in Abkhazia, which shouldn't be your problem. But when what's available from Nguri goes down and they have no other sources and they control the switchboards, it is, of course, very tempting to take more than 40%. They very seldom take 100%. Um, they frequently go up above 60%. It is absolutely true that it is in Georgia's interest for Abkhazia to get control of consumption. Um, it is absolutely in Georgia's interest to um, encourage Abkhazia to ban cryptocurrency permanently. Abkhazia, the de facto Abkhazian government would argue, and I give it for your consideration, I don't give you an answer because you know it better than I do. 
Um, yeah. But building the additional 120 megawatt facilities in Abkhazia um, actually makes it more likely that there will still be power for Georgia uh, during the coldest months. Um, so it, it is a complex problem. Abkhazia does not have enough power of its own. Abkhazia should build more wind and solar. And frankly, Abkhazia should build some thermal as well. Um, they should not be fully reliant on two facilities that are jointly controlled. Um, but their current situation is that. And economically, they have been unable or unwilling to um, allocate the resources to do it differently. Yeah, thank you so much, Teresa. We, we, we could have touched upon some other issues also, not only related to uh, hydropower uh, generation in Georgia, but also issues related to uh, gas, for example, or uh, oil, um, um, uh, petrol and uh, many other issues. For example, environmental issues like uh, consumption of wood that is, uh, that is called in Georgian uh, energy balances, call, it's under, under the uh, bio, bio uh, fuel, uh, or actually this is, this is uh, wood from the forest that, uh, that causes deforestation of some areas in Georgia. And this is quite high, uh, to my view, around 20%. Uh, so according to calculation from the energy balance. Uh, this is really, really a problem also that steel in Georgia is widely used uh, wood as a, as a heating uh, uh, mean or uh, uh, heating possi possibility to heat the, the buildings. Uh, and, this, is uh, a, this is a very big problem, yeah. Yes, yes, and also, also some other issues related to monopolies uh, on uh, gas supplies from uh, uh, Azerbaijan Sokar, for example, the, the Azerbaijani company and the Russian Gazprom also, these two monopolists that, that also own uh, not only uh, providing, providing uh, importing uh, uh, energy in Georgia, but also uh, holding some distribution, uh, 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 distribution uh, grids. And uh, uh, this is also against the energy community rules, as I know. So finally, would it be for Georgia possible to uh, to deal with these uh, big monopolies and uh, powerful neighbors uh, and uh, uh, comply with, with EU rules regarding the disbinding of, of the uh, energy, uh, in, in this case, of the gas market? Uh, so many, many other issues that are very interesting, and it would be necessary to have more uh, <laughs> Uh, one more hour at least to talk to you, but still maybe uh, uh, briefly you can you can also refer to this to these issues. Sure. Um, so Georgia's obligation under the European Union a key um, is to build natural gas storage, and as you know, um, Georgia is going forward with the Samgori South Dome gas project. Um, essentially, um, the European Union doesn't care whether it's run as a commercial project or whether it's run as a state-owned project, but to serve Georgia national security interests. Um, I don't know, I haven't been to visit since, um, since COVID hit all of our countries, but where this problem was when, when last I was able to look at it in person, um, the government was looking at making the rules depending on the month of the year. So the reserves had to remain uh, very full if it was early in the fall, but the further you went, the closer you were to the spring, the more you could release gas for commercial interests and not save it for an emergency. Um, having the gas so storage, particularly if it's well managed and regulated, um, helps both with Georgian energy security and it also helps push back against monopolies. And the reason for this is you can fill the storage facility in the summer when gas is transiting your country and the price of gas is very low, and then you can pull it out later. The problem um, with, with, with making it more European is that there is one big advantage that Georgia still enjoys in its relationship with Azerbaijan, and that is that it is still being given, um, it, in payment for being a transit country, it is paid in volume, not in price. 
So Georgia yeah. gets to keep a fixed percentage of the gas that goes across its territory. Um, this has been a huge advantage for Georgia because the price of gas fluctuates a lot, but the volume fluctuates less than the price. But, 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 the, but the, the energy community treaty also obliged Georgia to, uh, there is reservation for the moment, yes. but it's, it's temporary as I know, right? Uh, until... that's, correct. that's correct. And it was because of the signing of the Aki that Russia said, forget it. We know you've enjoyed getting a percentage in volume, but now we will deal only in price. And the Georgian citizens were very angry about this um, and felt yeah. that the Georgian government had had done something, had not bargained very well. In fact, under the Aki, eventually you will have to move to that with Azerbaijan as well. Um, and that is that does create some cost uncertainty. That does create a lot of reasons why Georgia has to get its house in order in natural gas before yeah, yeah, you move yeah. to that system. But I just want to point out that those those exceptions that the European Union gives you gives Georgia more time, but it's also difficult to improve transparency when you're still dealing in volumes and not in price. So so there is one of the costs of delaying this transition is that there leaves a certain room for some manipulation. Um, one of the differences that Georgia has with Azerbaijan, that's an interesting difference to look at is that Azerbaijan makes the argument that all Russia wants is market share, that Russia tries to pressure Azerbaijan and reduce their capability by seizing market share wherever they can get it. So from Azerbaijan's perspective, if Georgia only accepted a fixed small percentage of gas from Russia, that would be better. Those in Georgia who disagree say, no, no, no. If we're willing to buy from Russia somewhere between five and 10%, that gives us an ability to put pressure on Azerbaijan not to take advantage of us. Yeah. I would argue a third thing that is neither of those. Um, what the Georgian government has chosen to do is to allow some of the major industrialists to make deals directly with Russia. Okay. In my estimation, that is the course of action that allows the greatest room for corruption. If your major industry can go directly to Russia and get special deals, um, that takes away some power the state would have. I would prefer to see the Georgian government, I don't care whether they fix it at 5% or whether they say we're going to make it flexible between 5 and 10, but I would prefer to see the Georgian government step into this space than to let industry make deals directly. And that's because, of course, uh, Russia has longstanding practice of trying to develop special deals with industry to then work um, against the interests of Georgia overall. So, so this happens actually in Moldova, for example, and uh, some other places, yeah. Absolutely, where they, they, Russia captures practically the business uh, uh, circles and the industrialists through this, uh, 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 this is energy, energy weapon actually. It yes. uses like a political weapon for the, and this, this may happen in Georgia as well, yes, absolutely. Uh, I, I, I agree with your point you. of view. I, I think, and I think it's really important to look at this. Um, there are so many ways that the industrialists <laughs> could be captured. This one is extremely obvious um, and, and, and you would want to push against it. Um, the other thing, Kafa, that's very interesting is that the Georgian government was very fast to say when, when Azerbaijan, when Sokar said, we would like to be a part investor in the, um, in the gas storage project, um, Georgia was very quick to say, no, 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 we don't like the way that looks. One of the reasons why it might have been a good idea to let Sokar be a minority shareholder, not a majority, but a minority shareholder, minority, yeah. um, is because for any major gas producer, you want to have storage close to your biggest customer. Okay. And you want to have storage close to your biggest customer because it enhances your, your credibility and because in winter, in the very cold moments, uh, right at the moment when gas demand is going up, because gas compresses slightly in, in very cold temperatures, your supply is going down. So, for example, Russia always wanted to have major storage in Ukraine. Azerbaijan wants to have storage in Georgia close to Turkey. I would argue yeah. that if you may manage that well, that increases your importance as a transit state because now you're delivering another service to Azerbaijan and increases your leverage with Azerbaijan. The Georgian government saw foreign ownership in our strategic reserves and immediately thought that was a bad idea. 
there was another possible answer of, of uh, to consider, and that is that um, SOCAR could have been a good minority shareholder. Yeah, very interesting. Yes, very interesting advice. Thank you so much. Uh, well, I think we, we need to, for, unfortunately, I would say, because the, uh, the discussion is getting more and more interesting where we go into the uh, themes that are not usually explored, well explored in Georgia, and uh, we need to talk more about all this. Thank you so much, Teresa. We shall, we shall uh, finalize our meeting, and I expect uh, and I hope very much that uh, we will meet again. Uh, we will accumulate some more questions and more issues, and after all, the situation is very dynamic in Georgia and around Georgia, so <laughs> we always will have new situations. For, uh, we, we expect that this Namakhwani issue is resolved, uh, uh, will be resolved in the nearest future. So if it is resolved, then th this will be maybe another opportunity or another possibility for us to discuss what will happen now and how it should be managed and uh, what the government now should do, what the community should, uh, uh, how the community should respond to these issues, etc. So I think that we, we, we need uh, to talk more about all these issues. And thank you so much. And we, we are happy and we are uh, lucky to have friendship with such a good uh, and knowledgeable expert about our problems, our own problems, <laughs> Georgian problems. Well, an thank opportunity you. to work with Georgia and especially with the foundation is always, uh, yeah. always exciting for me. So thank you. Thank you very much. And I thank very much all the participants and those who were watching us uh, through um, uh, through media, through Facebook or other Twitter and other possibilities that, that, that are connected. So thank you all of you and uh, see you next time. Thank you everyone. All the best.